raised on the east side of Wilmington. Um, for the first 10 years of my life, I lived on East 8th Street across from People's Settlement. Uh, and then um, when I was 10 years old, my father bought a house that was two blocks away on Pine Street. Uh, I had a sister who was uh, 18 months younger than I am. And then I had a, another sister who was 10 years younger than I was. So there were two sisters and myself. We had a very full life on the east side of uh, Wilmington. Um, we had, uh, we had first-hand knowledge and, and uh, touch and base with all of the African-American leaders who were in our community. Um, and so uh, I lived there, went to high school, uh, ended up at the Wallet Street YMCA. And so I had uh, quite a few friends and contacts and leadership roles to uh, emulate as I grew up as a young kid on the east side of Wilmington. I was in the high wide program. We played basketball, we swam, uh, we went camping. Uh, the Wall Street Y ran a, a camp out on the Brandywine, uh, out right out off of 202 just before the Delaware line. So I had a lot of activities. That's basically where I got my leadership skills and my contacts and friends all came from belonging to the Wall Street Y and participating in the programs for youth. I lived across the street um, for the first 10 years of my life at People's Settlement. And then when I was 10 years old, moved around on, Penn, on Pine Street. But because People's Settlement was for all white students and children, I never entered the People's Settlement, even though I could walk out my front door and throw a stone across the street and hit the People's Settlement every day. So the People's Settlement and Bancroft School were completely off of my target because at that time, because of the racial segregation here in Wilmington, and Bancroft School was for the white students, and People's Settlement was for white students, and all of the black students went to basically number 29 school, which was right at 12th and Poplar. And then when I finished my first six years of school at number 29 and went into the junior high school at Howard High School, the next block down, 13th. So most of my youth was spent between Wallet Street Y and uh, Howard High School in the east side of Wilmington. Harry Andrews came here and uh, sort of refurbished the whole musical program at Howard High School. So I became a, a very active participant as a choir member, a uh, member of the band, a member of uh, the different activities that were sponsored through the high school. We, we had a, a young lady uh, who was a staff member uh, at Central State Ms. Mercer, Inez Mercer, and she talked to us. She had a group of us meet uh, together with her a couple times on a couple of her vacations. And uh, I was just convinced that that was the place in the world to be when, uh, after I heard uh, Inez Mercer explain the, what was happening. And I was very happy to have done that. Uh, I went to Central State and that's where I met my first wife and uh, we got married after I uh, graduated from Central State. I was commissioned in the U.S. Army um, upon graduation and spent two years in the uh, military. Uh, I was with a program uh, that was designed at that period of time. It was called Surface to Air Missile Program. It was designed to defend the major cities here in the continental United States and the uh, federal government set up these uh, missile sites around all of the major cities. I was around the Boston Providence defense that was the, what that particular circle was called. And um, I did uh, six months 
in, uh, at Fort Bliss in Texas uh, training to uh, handle these missiles and become an officer in a missile program. And then I was placed on a site, as they called it, on, which was defending the Boston Providence area. I left the uh, service and I went to Union, New Jersey to be a teacher. And I was a teacher for about six years, teaching uh, general science in a junior high school. And um, my friend, the late Leonard L. Williams, Judge Williams, called me and uh, suggested that uh, I, it was time for me to come back to Wilmington. And I had convinced him that uh, no way would I return to Wilmington. I remembered the segregated ways of Delaware. I remembered all of the things that I was not able to do here in Delaware and became very comfortable with New Jersey. But Lenny persisted and he kept saying, but we need you here. And I said, well, you don't really need me there, but I will come back and interview. And so I did, in fact, uh, interview for an administrative position here in the Wilmington Public Schools. And of course, history uh, sort of took over from that point. Uh, they hired me, uh, or they offered, well, offered and hired me to be a, an assistant principal at the Warner Junior High School. And I said, well, uh, yeah, maybe, I'll, yeah, I'll take that position. And so I did, I came and worked for two years at Warner School. When I first came back, just what I had expected. My wife and I were gonna have a difficult time finding a place to live. And the, because the places where African Americans could buy houses that are in areas that they wanted to live, in many cases they weren't, couldn't you even allow you in. A good example, Lenny Williams, as a young attorney doing extremely well, had spotted a house that he wanted to live in, right in the city of Wilmington, the house that he finally bought, and his wife still lives there. The owners of the house did not want to show them the house. In fact, it may not have been the owners, it could have been the real estate people, I don't, we don't know yet, but they had decided no, um, you can't take him through that house to see that house. Now, Lenny was a promising young attorney. He practicing law, could afford the house. Uh, he could not see the house. So what Lenny did was get one of his lawyer friends to arrange to go see the house. What that friend did was to have Lenny dress up in coveralls and go in with him to look at the house. And Lenny walked around, he looked at the house and he saw the house and the, at the same time, the realtor talked with the attorney who was Lenny's friend and Lenny went to check all the stuff that he wanted to check and he came back and said to his friend, everything's in order, we can talk about this afterwards. So they left and it wasn't until when Lenny showed up at the closing of the house that it became apparent to the owner of what had happened. So first of all, housing became a problem. For us, uh, when we moved back into Wilmington, we moved over near Pierce de Pont and we had no problem, uh, the house, but it was only because I wasn't the first black <laughs> buying there. There was already about three black families in that neighborhood, so I didn't have that problem. But there were those kinds of problems that did exist and continued to exist for quite some time. And at the time, the superintendent, um, uh, Gene Geiser, said to me, uh, 
Joe, we really need you at the high school level. Uh, your familiarity with the young people and the way you interact. Uh, I think you would do okay at the high school. And I said, no, no, Gene, I'm very comfortable right here at this junior high school because I knew that once you go to the high school, you got to go to the football games and the night basketball games and all the night activities. But in the junior high school, I would come in the morning and have a great day and interact with the teachers and the children. And in the evening, I could go home and do what I wanted to do. But uh, just to make a long story short, I did in fact go to P.S. DuPont High School as an assistant principal. And at the end of the, my first year there, the principal just decided he was gonna quit. And so I got tapped to be the principal at the P.S. DuPont High School. And for two years, I was doing what I thought a great job until the superintendent came back and said, Joe, the teachers want to negotiate these contracts. We don't have anyone. And I know you've had this, just a little bit of experience and a couple courses in collective bargaining. Uh, we'd really like to move you to the personnel department. And we want you to take over the responsibility of negotiating contracts for the Wilmington School District. Well, I had never really negotiated. I had taken these courses, taken college courses, and actually being on the line, facing individuals whose life works and their whole world zeroed around being in the union. But I said, okay, I'll, I'll try it. And so I did, and I stayed in that job as a, and negotiated contracts. And the Wilmington Public School Districts had six different union contracts, you know, the teachers, the paraprofessionals, the secretaries, the custodians, the maintenance people, each group had a separate contract. And so I became pretty good at negotiating contracts and started enjoying it. You know, it was one of those things that uh, allowed me a lot of freedom, uh, a lot of, um, to use my ability to convince people. And so I, I was very comfortable doing that. Uh, and having done that job, uh, again, they needed somebody else to do something differently. And it was then that um, I was tapped to move up as assistant superintendent. And then after two years, I took over as the superintendent of the Wilmington Public School District. The parents in Wilmington decided <coughs> that the Wilmington Public Schools were just as segregated as they were for each of the previous occasions that the Supreme Court had ruled it was wrong. So the parents here decided to get Lewis Redding and uh, others to open, reopen the case that the Wilmington District itself had not, in fact, not only the Wilmington District, but the 11 school districts, including Wilmington here in Newcastle County, had not, in fact, honored the court order and uh, responded in a favorable manner. As the uh, chief school officer of this district, uh, it was incumbent upon me to alert the judge to the inequities that were occurring in um, cases, not just here in Wilmington or in Delaware, but around the country where um, the school districts would agree to a court order, but you would see minority administrators, some who had been principals, they had been principals of the black high school, as people would say, but there was no position for them in this new arrangement. And so, and we had teachers who basically had taught in the all black schools, and they were basically losing their jobs, or at best, being given jobs that were not comparable to the level of uh, their education and or their accomplishments in the classroom. I was able to pinpoint specific districts that were in violation. I was able to identify specific 
uh, concepts and violations that were being done to minority administrators, teachers, and even students. So I did. I testified for approximately six days here in the U.S. District Court, and I was able to uh, lay out for uh, Judge Mary Swartz, who was the sitting judge, those areas that needed to be addressed and those concerns that should be um, removed from what was happened, what had happened before, so that in the new case, we had specific instructions and an understanding exactly what was expected in this new district. So the court did in fact go along with that and established the single district that combined all 11 school districts and called it the Newcastle County School District. It still was not as large as the uh, Dade County School District that I had done my internship in, but it was a pretty good sized district because 11 school districts came together. I was still a superintendent, um, but um, the members of the board of at that time it was called Area 3 because we didn't have names. Um, Area 3 had uh, contacted me. Uh, I had already decided that with all of this new arrangements that there probably would be a difficult time for me trying to find a job under this new arrangement. So I had become a candidate for the superintendency in the Dayton um, Ohio Public School District and the uh, Ohio Public School District board came to Wilmington and they spent four days interviewing people and what have you and the uh, president of that area board um, decided to contact me and talk to me about if I were to be uh, appointed or offered a position to stay here in the Delaware area, would I consider that? And I said, oh, I certainly would. I, I really like Delaware, I like where I am. And um, so uh, I was then offered the position to uh, take over in the district that became the Red Clay Consolidated School District. And I stayed in that district uh, in that position for nine years until it was my time to retire and uh, I retired from education after serving the nine years as a superintendent of Red Clay, three years as superintendent of Wilmington and those other positions. Earl Jackson uh, was the uh, first superintendent and, and then uh, Dr. Minter was the second person uh, he was the superintendent of the uh, Wilmington District first, and then uh, so we we did have uh, there were two individuals who were superintendents in Wilmington. Now, in some of the cases, there were individuals in different parts of the state who had superintendent or had leadership roles that they probably considered themselves to be a superintendent because they operated school districts um, or operated schools. We had some great school administrators, uh, school administrators of color who were here in Wilmington. Uh, I have to be very happy with the high school education that I had and the way the school district was operated when I was in my 12 years in the Wilmington schools. Wilmington had a, a, a very strong uh, Hispanic population and a significant number of Hispanic students who attended the schools in Wilmington. And even some of the um, Hispanic uh, speaking students lived outside of the city of Wilmington. I mean, they didn't attend Wilmington schools, they attended the, the um, other in the 11 school districts. The Hispanic um, Parents Association 
uh, stepped forward and said to Judge Swartz that uh, we're talking about all of this, uh, what happens to the black students and the white students. No one has spoken up for students uh, of Hispanic origin. And so it became very apparent that there was a very strong component within, especially within the Wilmington system. And when you start looking at some of the other areas, now we had individuals who spoke all uh, some other languages, but we did put in a very strong component with um, the Hispanic speak for the Hispanic speaking students. We actually hired administrators who had uh, who were Hispanic and spoke the language and we were able to put in programs. And the good thing about putting in the programs, there were other students who benefited from that. You know, many students who had just been taking a foreign language in their classroom, uh, now were able to participate in a Spanish-speaking classroom. And um, so we profited from that, the students profited from that. And I'm very proud of the, the fact that uh, that component came forth and the judge recognized it and insisted that that be uh, addressed in the, new, in the new arrangement. Every year, there's a Delaware Superintendent of the Year. We all belong to the uh, National Association of School Administrators. And the, that association identifies um, superintendents in each state, just as the Teacher of the Year is identified in each state. And uh, it just so happens that um, in that one year uh, that the superintendents here in Delaware uh, decided to uh, recommend me to be the superintendent of the year for Delaware. And the national group then accepted that appointment and uh, took me to Orlando for a a very large conference that was very enjoyable, a lot of fun, but you know, one of those things that you could just sort of put on your chalkboard. Most of the people um, in and around Wilmington uh, today, um, well, maybe not most of the people, many of the people do, uh, recognize the importance of Lewis L. Reddy and his family. Uh, uh, Lewis, of course, was the nationally known attorney, but his sisters, uh, C. Gwendolyn Redding was my English teacher at Howard High School. Uh, his uh, uh, sister Lillian Redding was an elementary teacher here in Wilmington. And Jay Saunders Redding, his brother, was an outstanding professor at um, Hampton uh, and has written many books. So Lenny Williams, who was a partner uh, of, the, of Lou Reddings, and shortly after the, uh, Lou died, uh, Lenny continued to operate that, uh, his law firm there. Uh, they decided that, um, well, oh, it was MBNA moved in. MBNA moved to Wilmington and was buying up all of the properties and happened to buy up the same uh, property where the Reading House was sitting. So Lenny with others uh, decided this could be a very uh, historic place, uh, has a lot of history with it. So he uh, and his friends contacted the uh, MBNA and asked them if they would donate that house. And the uh, they said, sure, you know, we, they weren't going to do anything but just tear it down, and they did. Uh, and after a very short period of time, they contacted uh, Lenny and said, you need to move that house because we, we had some pretty tall buildings we we're going to be putting up in that area. And so Lenny looked around and there wasn't too many people who could just lift up a house and move it. So he decided to go back to the and talk to MBNA again and tell them that, you know, we really do want the house, we'd like to move it somewhere. And uh, so MBNA 
gracefully, uh, gracelessly uh, agreed to move that house from its location up on 10th Street, just above Walnut Street Y, to a location to be named, and it was moved to 11th and Wilson, uh, right across from the Elwin Institute. And so in order to move the house, uh, they had to get some individuals, who, some professionals came, and they had to go around the whole base of the house and cut every brick all the way around so that they could lift up the house intact, put it on the trailer, and move it from 10th Street, just above the Walnut Street Y, down a block and a half down in front of Elwin and sit it back down on some pilings where it sat for about three or four months. And then finally, a basement was built under it. And the Reading House exists now at 11th and Wilson. Uh, and uh, we are very proud of, of that uh, place. We uh, have programs. Uh, we have the uh, barristers, the Delaware barristers have become sponsors each year. They uh, give us money to help operate that facility. I'm, I'm very pleased. I, I enjoy being here in uh, Wilmington and um, I still have many, many friends. Uh, and so I just hope to spend quite a few days here, right here in the city of Wilmington.